Religion is sort of like having a BB gun. It's all fun and games until somebody loses an eye. Some of us have taken shots from religion. They hurt. Others have taken shots at religion, and that hurts too. Perhaps a few have lost an eye or have a blurred vision of their religion. Many have become show blind. We attend religious services to enjoy the show. We see the people on stage, we follow their instructions when not too intrusive. And if the man or woman on stage gets too demanding or we don't think they're playing their part appropriately, we simply move on to warm a seat in a new theater with a more understanding pastor or rabbi. When religion deteriorates into a spectator sport, we cease being people of true faith. To fully enjoy our religion, whatever it is, we must transcend the show and become engaged participants within and without the forums of faith. It is my hope that we can all determine where we belong in religion and fulfill the purpose to which God has called us. Therein we enjoy the value added to our lives and families. A loving, vibrant faith lived inwardly and outwardly will also endear our religion to those around us in need of a more secure foundation. Our society has been damaged by the attacks against families and faith. The foundations have been destabilized. This book asks and answers hard questions about foundational elements of Judaism and Christianity. Both religions address the problem of sin in the lives of adherents. As can be seen in headlines around our nation, plagued by violence and chaos, when left unchecked, the sin problem creates devastating consequences. But there is a fix. This book will detail the solutions proposed by two religions. Both have historically addressed the sin problem through sacrifice and atonement with some confusing distinctions that deserve clarification. Regarding this, I believe God has been clear about one thing in particular. Not all sacrifices are created equal. In another very confusing time long ago, God's appointed high priest declared, This is thy God, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. And they rose up early on the morrow and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to make merry. And the Lord spoke unto Moses, Go, get thee down. For thy people that thou broughtest up out of the land of Egypt have dealt corruptly. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made them a molten calf and have worshiped it and have sacrificed unto it and said, This is thy God, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said unto Moses, I have seen this people and behold, it is a stiff-necked and so it goes when we take religion into our own hands and create rituals or regulations not ordered by God. Of course, the, the text I just quoted you from the Jewish Publication Society of the Hebrew Bible went on to detail the fiasco of the golden calf. Thousands, literally thousands, were killed at God's command as a result of their sin which was a failed effort at religion with an incorrect sacrifice. Not all sacrifices are created equal. I like what one modern paraphrase of the Bible describes as God's response that day to religion gone awry. He said as follows, when I settle accounts, their sins will certainly be part of the settlement. 
God sent a plague on the people because of the calf they and Aaron had made. Not all sins are created equal, but none are ignored. So what do we do with sin? As I go on and describe the contents of this book titled, God, Forgive Me, the book will answer that for any question. So it's time I provide an introduction to what you're going to see and hear and what I have written. So this would be my introduction, or as I like to think of it, as my moment on the soapbox. Newsflash, God hates religious hypocrisy. It is a particularly distasteful dysfunction for Jews or Christians to exhibit. Therefore, a gut check must be proposed. After all, Jews and Christians share a connection to the God of Israel, to Israel's Bible, and to each other. We're supposed to know better than to wallow in religious hypocrisy. Yet many of us have become experts at sounding righteous, judging others for not being righteous enough, acting self-righteously, or being unwilling to be tolerant of the obviously unrighteous who have rejected the standards by which we have chosen to live. Remember, we, we just can't expect those who reject our standards to adhere to them. And those who are obviously unrighteous immediately recognize when we give ourselves grace to live below our standards while harshly judging them for living below the standards they never volunteered to follow. That hypocrisy should not be tolerated in our ranks. God sets the standards. He doesn't care about our opinions of his decrees. So I have a question. What did God think about his people's lack of care for his laws and the immoral views tolerated and sometimes celebrated by his people? I'll give you God's answer. No matter what I do for them, they still don't care. Oh, what a sinful nation they are. As a modern American man of faith, I have an honest question to consider. Could this same thing be said about our nation? The prophet continued, Born to be bad, they have turned their backs upon the Lord and have despised the Holy One of Israel. They have cut themselves off from His help. We need God. Yet we dismiss him. Have we gone too far? It seems to me we need God's help more than ever. Yet as a nation, we have more moral chaos and less respect for God than is wise. The Bible says, Oh, my people, haven't you had enough of punishment? Why will you force me to whip you again and again? Must you forever rebel? The news outlets and nearly every form of social media glaringly prove our spiritual rebellion is in high gear. Will the outcome described by the prophet be our fate? He said, your country lies in ruins. Your cities are burned while you watch. Foreigners are destroying and plundering everything they see. You stand there helpless and abandoned. Is this an apt comparison to how we act in America? And if so, what should we expect if we remain on our current path? If the Lord Almighty had not stepped in to save a few of us, we would have been wiped out as Sodom and Gomorrah were. An apt comparison. Do we shudder at the thought of being compared to Sodom and Gomorrah? As I call you now, listen to the Lord. Hear what he is telling you. Will we listen? Since this conversation is about sacrifices and atonement, these texts cause me to remember
and OJ. I see a nation with too many politicians who have pandered away their purpose. I see a system with too many lawyers, yet too few who show concern for God's laws. I see too many jurists who have jettisoned their judiciousness. I see dignitaries who have disposed of their dignity. I see judgment on the horizon if we fail to repent and turn to God. Therefore, I hope that we as the people of God will return to Him and He will receive us and provide atonement for our sins so that we might enjoy His blessings again as a nation. The promise from God is those who return to the Lord, who are just and good, shall be redeemed. But all sinners shall utterly perish, for they refuse to come to me. Shame will cover you. And therein lies America's greatest problem. We have lost our sense of shame. Few among us know to blush because most among us have lowered the bar so far that we have no reason to hate our sins or find them as despicable as God does. Instead of recognizing our failure as a society to live according to the standards of behavior and morality that God has established, we measure ourselves with a defective yardstick. We look pretty good when compared to the run-of-the-mill godless sinners. Some of us even seem saintly compared to haughty, God-fearing sinners who go deeper in filth than others who hide it better. As Paul warned against, they are only comparing themselves with each other, using themselves as the standard of measurement. How ignorant! My prayer is that God has not reached His limit of disappointment and exasperation. May we seek restoration and reconciliation to God, and may He forgive us. I'm stepping off of the soapbox now, trying not to trip. How many of us have asked the question, God, will you forgive me? Some may assume that the gracious character of God is such that He must forgive us if we ask. Others may think His willingness to forgive is conditioned on our ability to offset our bad actions with a greater weight or quantity of good actions. The essence of such a conclusion might create a desire to lead a moral life to counterbalance wrongdoing with right doing. And that's not a terrible decision though there may be better ones. Still, some may feel forgiveness is not available to them based on the horrific nature of their specific behavior. In other words, they may feel their actions were unforgivable. Therefore, their destiny is one of bad luck, cursed decisions, and at best, they will end up as the tortured subject of a sad country song. My dog died, my truck won't crank. I'm out of beer and my bass boat sank. <laughs> well, there are at least two other interesting groups of folks who have a more measured view of how to obtain forgiveness from God. And for the purposes of this conversation, I will limit this investigation to sincere followers of Judaism and Christianity observant Jews and faithful Christians base their core beliefs on the Bible. I chose the two adjectives observant and faithful carefully. There are at least a dozen flavors of Judaism and literally tens of thousands of options for selecting a favorite form of Christianity. I am interested in the practices of both ancient Jews and modern Jews were informed about ancient Jews by investigating the Hebrew Bible. We learn about contemporary Judaism from exploring their more modern rabbinic writings and traditions. I'm also focused on modern Christians who still adhere to evangelical biblical orthodoxy as declared in the New Testament and anchored to the Old Testament. Such Jews 
and most Christians recognize the simple presuppositions that sin is bad, God is good, and the Bible prescribes a spiritual transaction to overcome the guilt and punishment due sinners. One term commonly used by both groups to express this transaction is atonement. Atonement is the theme for one of Judaism's most well-known festivals, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. This special day concludes the famous Jewish High Holy Days. Christians pursue atonement differently. Both religions value the concept of sacrifice as part of the atonement process. However, their conclusions are quite different and interesting. The distinctive interpretations of atonement and sacrifice within modern Judaism, ancient Judaism, and Christianity will be probed. Admittedly, I have an agenda, hence the alert in this conversations uh, section title, an agenda alert. I, I'm Jewish. Judaism is imprinted on every family memory and on every single member of my family. Judaism is what always preserved our family. Judaism is also what drove my father of blessed memory from his native homeland where other Jewish family members suffered and were slaughtered by those who hated Jews. Most tragically, that hatred was often perpetrated by Christians. Perhaps that was why declaring my faith in Jesus as the Messiah cost me the relationships I most cherished. My family and my Jewish friends turned away from me many years ago in early 1973 when I entered Christian ministry. Nevertheless, the fact of my Jewishness is unchanged. My love for my heritage remains precious. I have no reason to hide my beliefs or step back from my Jewish identity. I believe in the grace of God. I rejoice in His love for me and for my people. With the psalmist, I confess, O oh Israel, hope in the Lord, for He is loving and kind and comes to us with arm loads of salvation. He himself shall ransom Israel from her slavery to sin. I love that. Armloads of salvation are available. God wants to reach into our lives and break any links that might bind us to bad habits, failures, emotional scars, unintentional and intentional sins, he himself shall ransom Israel. He will pay the full price of the ransom to have us released from captivity. Another modern translation is even more expressive. No doubt about it, he'll redeem Israel. Buy back Israel from captivity to sin. Now, these words may seem extreme. The concepts could feel foreign to folks who see themselves as good people. If people hold themselves to a low enough standard, they may truly believe they're good enough. It's a self-deception. They're only good enough if they compare themselves to very bad people. God requires true righteousness, not self-righteousness or partial purity. Such errant beliefs about being good enough call to mind a sarcastic comment made by the famous concert pianist actor Oscar Levant. He said, I can remember Doris Day before she was a virgin. Obviously, this son of Orthodox Jewish immigrants was being witty when he described the Hollywood icon in that manner. She was praised by reporters in her obituary as Hollywood's favorite girl next door. Her fans saw her as the all-American goody two-shoes gal portrayed in her later films. However, she had a less pristine image earlier in her career. and She was married four times. Levant's comment humorously elevates a concept I want to explore. Once someone has performed an act that is classified as a sin, having sinned, they are 
a sinner. Cleaning up one's act doesn't remove their moral deficit. It merely makes them a less repulsive sinner. Atonement is the answer to our problematic question of sin. We are made impure when we commit sin. Purity in God's sight is the goal to which we should strive. And this is not something we can attain without God's help after our lives have been blemished by a sin. Purity in God's sight is not achieved by aspiring to be more virginal than Doris Day or in becoming the nicest person in church or in temple. Unfortunately, we're out of time. We'll pick up right where we left off in the next episode. If you don't want to wait that long, though, you can order a copy of this book or even get a free, no strings attached PDF copy at our website, crosstalk.org. Until next time, shalom and God bless.